When a company adopts a mathematical model to predict milestones from bug find rates, you can imagine the pressure on testers to keep the total count of open bugs below n. All the testers have to do to meet that pressure is to find only what they're expected to find. A few years ago, I taught a testing course at a big famous software company. This company had an active metrics program. They had quality assurance staff from head office. Sometimes when testers were finding too many bugs before a QA visit, the project manager would send all the testers to the movie for the afternoon. The testers found this funny and they went along until one week they were sent to the movies five times. That was the end of the movies. So the next time the head office's QA people were coming, the local managers hired me to teach a five-day testing class. I was the new version of the movies. Another way that testers can manage the number of open bugs in the database before a milestone is to keep the open bugs out of the database. Some groups use post-it notes for this. They write a bug on a post-it and they stick it on the inside wall of one of the cubicles. The programmers stop by and look at the post-it notes. A post-it bug can be fixed and when it's fixed it goes into the bug tracking system because now there's no open bug so we can keep a record of it. After the milestone has been met, there's no pressure to keep the bug numbers down, at least for a few more weeks. So the testers take all these post-it bugs that are still open and enter them into the bug tracking system. I've seen some very detailed bug count presentations from some metrics consultants pointing to this motivational effect of meeting a milestone. See, it seems that testers get so excited when a milestone happens that they go off and discover all sorts of new bugs. Maybe there is this productivity spike. On the other hand, maybe it's just all those post-its that are finally going into the database now that the metrics consultants have stopped looking for a couple weeks. This type of mismatch between what happens on the project and what the head office's quality assurance or metrics people think is happening is the key reason that Doug finally wrote his paper on the dark side of software metrics. Some people get offended by the examples I've given so far because they get the impression that these are testers who are intentionally deceiving the rest of the company. Actually, my experience is that the testers are doing what they think they're supposed to do under those circumstances. Following these curves creates circumstances that drive down the bug rate without involving any hint of deception. For example, many test groups create new tests every build, but they also reuse tests from previous build. As the projects go forward, the testers use more of the old tests. This is called regression testing. And if they use more of the old tests, they spend less time creating new tests. Well, old tests rarely expose new bugs. If there was a bug, the test would have already exposed it. So the more you rely on regression tests, the fewer bugs you find. People who believe the bug rate model is correct expect a declining bug rate. So when they see one, they see results that meet their expectations. They have no reason to look past the numbers to ask why the bug find rate is dropping. There are lots of variations on this theme. If we predict that testers will find fewer bugs each week, we're not going to be alarmed, we're not going to manage things differently, we're not going to ask any hard questions when we see fewer bugs each week. Even if the drops are actually caused more by the testers doing non-testing activities, like writing more status reports, training more tech support staff, or polishing their test documentation. In fact, these are tasks that are often set for testers as the project goes on. So the bug rates go down because the testers are distracted and the distractions are often caused by management. There's no deception at all. Just bad expectations leading to acceptance of bad results. I prefer to manage bug find rates from a different model. Don't take this curve too seriously. It's conceptual not statistical. In my model, I do want the bug find rate to climb early in testing, but it's okay for the rate to climb a little slowly if people are doing work that will boost their productivity with more complex tests later. How do I know if they're doing that kind of work? I talk with them about what they're doing. Later in testing, I interpret a declining bug rate as a warning. If I'm not finding very many bugs, it's time to try more powerful tests or to test other parts of the program, or to try testing more complex combinations of features. If one test technique isn't finding many bugs, try another one. As the program gets more stable, you run more complex tests that take more time to design. So maybe the bug find rates are going to fall. But on the other hand, as the program gets more stable, you can also run more automated tests. It takes a long time to program a test automation framework for high volume automated testing. But once that's running, the test automaton can generate millions of tests or test sequences. Bug find rates might go up for a while. But eventually we run out of ideas for new tests. 
the bug find rate drops, and we don't know how to substantially bring it back up. That's when to ship the product. Not because we're out of bugs, but because we're out of ideas. We don't know how to find the bugs that are left in the product, so there's no point in keeping the product and testing any longer. A stunning number of testing consultants tell us that it's better to manage a project with bad metrics than no metrics, because you can't manage projects without metrics. Bob Austin's book takes this absolutely crazy idea on, working through the theory and the practical disaster of measurement dysfunction. So let me recap. I presented three examples of surrogate measures, using bug counts to assess tester effectiveness, using code coverage to assess testing completeness, and using bug counts to assess the project schedule. All three of these are common, and all three cause big problems. If all you have are surrogate measures, you're probably better off not using them. This doesn't mean we should never count bugs. It doesn't mean we should never look at code coverage. My experience, Hoffman's experience, Merrick's experience, Box's experience, we've all found these counts useful. We'll all use them again. But we have to be very careful in what we use these for, in how we use them, in who we communicate them to, and whether we ever encourage people to change their behavior, to change their numbers, and we have to be really careful in what we present to management. Eventually, we will develop trustworthy, validated, quantitative measures for much of the things we're interested in as test managers and as project managers, but we don't have those now. I've been working with qualitative measures. These pose their own challenges, but so far what I've been finding is that the process of developing these and using them is really quite valuable. They keep me much more in touch with the details of the quality of my staff's work or of my students' work. You'll see an example of this in the Bug Advocacy course's main assignment. In that assignment, we evaluate the quality of bug reports that other testers have filed in open office. What you get from those reports is not just an understanding of whether the bug's reproducible or not reproducible. You get an understanding of how good the tester is who's writing the report. Well, that's it for this course. I hope you enjoyed it. Good luck on your exam.